Welcome everybody. Welcome everybody. I'm glad you could join us and I'm especially glad that Dr. Siobhan is able to join us. Uh, Dr. Siobhan is from uh, uh, Children's Hospital of LA. Uh, she came to us via Canada where she trained initially at McGill in Montreal, did her GI fellowship at the University of Montreal, and then she did both a master's in health services, in health science and epidemiology, um, and an advanced IBD fellowship at the University of British Columbia. Um, she's currently at Children's Hospital of LA, uh, where she's an assistant professor and focuses on the care of and optimizing the care of children with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, she's uh, active at the national and international level in our societies, both our pediatric GI society, but also in the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation where she's on the National Scientific Advisory uh, um, Committee. Um, she's a recipient of the KL2 scholarship um, where she's using this opportunity to expand her interest in point of care monitoring of patients, including non-invasive monitoring, such as with abdominal ultrasound as a, as a biomarker of disease activity. So I'm really um, happy to introduce her. I'm happy that she's here and I'm excited to hear her talk about um, the evolution of disease monitoring in pediatric inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, so thanks for joining us. Thank you for this introduction. Let me just share this slide. <clears throat> um, there we go. All right, so it's uh, uh, really an honor to be able to present um, some of the um, uh, research to, to you uh, on uh, monitoring uh, disease activity in pediatric IBD. Um, I know there's a lot of really interesting, fascinating IBD research going on in Michigan, so I hope this is not too repetitive. Uh, but some of this may tie in quite well with a recent lecture by Dr. Lipstein uh, that, that was about uh, shared decision making, and um, but it, more of a deep dive in, in IBD um, and um, background. So I have no relevant disclosures. So the first half of my talk will be a little bit about setting the stage for uh, why monitoring IBD is important um, and, and, and the changing epidemiology of IBD in children. Um, and the second part of the talk will be uh, more of a, a where I wanna take this research and discuss current issues in disease monitoring in IBD. So uh, let's just uh, start with a, a deep dive or a somewhat of a deep dive into uh, what is IBD and how common is it? Um, so IBD, as you know, uh, is a, a chronic autoimmune uh, disease uh, causing manifesting as inflammation uh, of the gut. Um, and it comes uh, in a simplified fashion as two flavors. So either Crohn's disease, which uh, uh, manifests as inflammation that can be anywhere from the mouth to the anus uh, versus ulcerative colitis, which is uh, which has more of a predictive pattern uh, of uh, continuous inflammation that starts generally from the rectum and ascends more and more proximal areas um, of the colon. Well, really, IBD is a, a heterogeneous group of disease uh, that comes in a spectrum. So there is a lot of heterogeneity even within those two classes and some patients who don't quite fit into either category that we uh, have reclassified as indeterminate colitis. Um, therefore, the presentation of the disease can be quite variable based on the location of the inflammation and the severity of the inflammation. So the uh, symptoms uh, that are common uh, in our patients when they first present is uh, the diarrhea, of course, and a bloody stool, having abdominal pain or weight loss. Um, the fatigue can be quite striking and sometimes it does not fully respond even to treatment. But IBD overall is a, a multi-systemic disease. So even outside of the gut, we can see uh, skin inflammation, eye inflammation, liver inflammation, and joint issues, um, and complications of these uh, ongoing uh, inflammation, or also depending on the area uh, affected, we can see a lot of micronutrient deficiencies and growth, um, um, growth delays. Um, but the most common symptom is IBD. Maybe it's not specific because we do see diarrhea in other conditions, some that are benign or functional. Um, therefore, when they first develop symptoms, um, it can be um, a little difficult to think about, you know, is, is Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis going on and therefore get uh, um, the diagnostic workup started. So IBD is common. 
Uh, about 1.2 million uh, people in, in, the, uh, in America are affected by this condition and about a quarter are uh, children. So uh, this is becoming a lot of patients to treat and I'm sure there's a lot you know, in Michigan such just as we're seeing in uh, Los Angeles um, with a growing numbers of these patients presenting to clinic. And what we've noted is even over the years, the incidence of uh, inflammatory bowel disease, both for Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, has been climbing. Um, so this is a systematic review of the literature looking at the different uh, reported incidents worldwide of, the, of inflammatory bowel disease in adults. And we see that since uh, the, it first was described, we've only have known an increase in incidence. And some of these increase even goes beyond just recognizing the disease. It really seems to be a true increase in um, the manifestation of the disease. In children as well, we have uh, a similar situation uh, where a recent, um, again, systematic review of reported incidents has shown a continuous increase in the uh, incidence of inflammatory bowel disease, although in some countries it seemed to have started to plateau. Um, and uh, from this Canadian data where they use uh, population health um, data um, as an analysis for the years um, 2000 to 2007, and, uh, and then projected what would be the, um, the likely uh, burden of disease in the future, we note that there continues to be a climb in the number of patients that will be presenting to healthcare. And that has a very important implication in terms of healthcare access and the um, healthcare costs that could come from the situation. Um, and why do we care about identifying the disease uh, early on? I think um, there was uh, some discussion about that uh, a, a few years ago when Dr. Adler presented, uh, but the delay in diagnosis has very important implication in IPD. First of all, how long do we uh, wait to see our patients? Um, so from symptoms onset, this is from a Canadian study again, and also uh, replicated in, um, in France, we see that the median time to presentation is about four months in both uh, areas uh, with uh, a range of, of uh, well, really went to zero to four years when you look at the, the range in the IQR. So 36% of the Canadian cohort were diagnosed over six months of symptom onset, even up to near 20% um, took even longer, so one to three years to be diagnosed. And we know that the disease process probably starts before even symptoms start. Um, therefore, by the time that they present to us, there probably is some significant bowel damage that may be irreversible. And we see that because when they stratified their cohort for um, the children who uh, had uh, delays in care higher than the 75th percentile, um, the rate of cumulative uh, complication for patients with Crohn's disease was quite a lot higher than um, those who did not have any delayed care. And we see that by uh, penetrating complications. So that is the development of fistulas or abscesses uh, was 10% in the delayed group as compared to 4% in the non-delayed group. Uh, same thing with stricturing disease, so a narrowing of the bowel that's irreversible. Um, there was 20% rate in the delayed group versus 12%, and uh, the growth impairment was more significant in uh, the delayed group, and that's even uh, when they adjusted for other confounders. So a delay in diagnosis may have um, important complications and imp important implications for the care of the patients and the, um, the potential for surgeries. Um, so, and the reason that happens is as the inflammation sets in and it's continuous over time, we see fibrosis. And in this time in 2022, we don't have uh, commercially available uh, therapies to address fibrosis. So this um, situation becomes non-reversible, causing strictures and this cumul uh, cumulative um, uh, 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 accumulation of, of uh, uh, fibrosis can lead to further complication like fistula, perforation, and that leads to surgeries. Older literature demonstrated that if you had a risk of one surgery, the risk of a subsequent surgery was higher um, with the advent of biologic therapy. Perhaps this is changing, um, but uh, looking at what we have, the information we have available at this moment, 
up to 50% if you look at older literature, maybe closer to 10, uh, 15%. Um, of children will require surgery at some point during their course of disease. Um, as I mentioned, we're now having more, more therapies available to treat inflammation effectively, um, but these treatments are not curative, so we're also looking at a long-term uh, treatment of our patient with IBD. And uh, even more so, these um, treatments do have a plateau. We, not everybody responds to therapy, um, there's a lot of questions about why we're reaching these plateaus and how we should approach therapies um, in this context. But uh, the monitoring of if our treatment is effective or not is very important into preventing the ongoing damage or um, inflammation that we may not think is going on. Uh, is this, this applied to ulcerative colitis? Probably. I think uh, uh, in the, when I first started training, we thought of ulcerative colitis as a mucosal disease um, and, and not a fibrotic disease, but this thought is changing from this beautiful work from the Cleveland Clinic who uh, looked at the surgical reception from patients with QC and noted that patients who had ongoing inflammation or chronic inflammation had also fibrosis and thickened uh, bowel wall in the colon. And therefore, um, we're kind of thinking that ulcerative colitis has this fibrotic complication as well. And that can have important um, implication for symptoms control because the colon doesn't function as well when there's a lot of fibrosis in the bowel wall, the motility is affected and that can cause symptoms uh, as well. So it will make patients quite uncomfortable. Um, therefore, an aggressive treatment of ulcerative colitis is also warranted to prevent this fibrosis. But how do we know if our inflammation is being adequately controlled? Um, so um, is symptoms enough to say that we have treated our IBD effectively? Um, so these studies uh, show that uh, probably relying to symptoms uh, on symptoms is not good enough to say that we have reached a um, uh, healing of the disease. So uh, the first graph here, or here, I'm not sure where you see the um, mouse, but uh, the first graph here using the Crohn's disease activity in, the, in adult, which is a clinical um, marker of disease activity um, based on symptoms and, and comparing to endoscopic activity, so repeating the colonoscopy and looking for inflammation, this cloud demonstrates that the symptoms were not really correlating with what we found on endoscopy. And in children, it was similar when we used uh, the pediatric Crohn's disease activity index as compared to the, small, uh, the simple endoscopic score for Crohn's disease, which is, uh, again, an endoscopic score to look at inflammation in patients with Crohn's disease, um, we also see that there um, is a poor correlation uh, between the symptoms and, I mean, there's this association, but the correlation is not really great uh, between the symptoms and the endoscopic markers, um, which are even weaker if you have mild disease. Um, therefore, symptoms is not good enough uh, to predict if uh, uh, we are doing a good job with the therapy that the patient is on. How about endoscopic targets? So when we looked at uh, some of the first studies using uh, infliximab as a, a treatment uh, for uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, we noted that when uh, stratifying for the patient who did reach uh, endoscopic improvement compared to those who did not uh, reach endoscopic improvement, we see a separation between avoiding uh, a risk of colectomy in patients with ulcerative colitis. And similarly, in Crohn's disease, reaching endoscopic um, uh, um, improvement early on in the disease also helped avoid any uh, complication. And therefore, we extrapolate that treating early the disease prevents fibrosis and therefore a risk for surgery over time. Um, so the target uh, to treat inflammatory bowel disease has moved through the years uh, from uh, focusing on clinical symptoms, and then we became more stringent, talking about steroid-free remission. Uh, but now we know that really use, uh, using mucosal healing, or there's studies to see some evidence, particularly in ulcerative colitis for histological healing, may be more um, accurate targets to re uh, reach long-term uh, improvement. So as we talked about, some of our medications have limitation in uh, the plateau of, of reaching um, uh, even clinical remission. So is it even uh, you know, a, a good target or a, a reachable target 
to say that we want to have mucosal healing with those therapies. Um, and that has been investigated with one of the seminal studies um, called the CALM studies that looked at a, a treatment algorithm in IBD using the uh, biologic adalimumab as their model. They showed that if you had a tight control model, so you're using an interim marker of disease activity, and here they used a fecal calprotectin, um, a stool test, uh, which uh, um, uh, is a marker of inflammation. It's a byproduct of granulocytes that sheds in the stool that we can measure. Um, so using this as an interim marker of inflammation and ingesting therapy based on having a, a high calprotectin, so active inflammation, I increased the, uh, the chance of, risk, of reaching mucosal healing at week 40 of the treatment algorithm compared to using symptoms alone or standard of care protocol, uh, where they reach only 30% compared to 15%, uh, 40, 35%. So having a tight control or interim markers that are objective in, as a reason to optimize treatment instead of only relying to symptoms does reach better outcomes over time. And if you can reach mucosal healing within the first year um, or two of the treatment, over time, so at year three and four, we see that we have continuous improvement uh, and, and chance of seeing off steroids, um, of having remission off steroids. So uh, having this early tight control protocol um, early in the course of disease and in, in the treatment uh, selection will give you long-term um, improvement uh, for the patients. Um, so since then, uh, as some of our leaders in IBD have come together and uh, put together what we call the STRIDE 2 guidelines. There was a STRIDE 1 before that uh, also investigated targets. We have now updated uh, the guideline within the last uh, year, two years or a year or so. Um, and the, what they really talk about to make it simple is to define a time frame to reassess um, disease activity and to reach disease control. And during that time frame, which can be, you know, the first year of treatment, well, let's say um, uh, six to nine months, uh, there needs to be interim assessment. So the first assessment would be when we assess for the disease activity, select a therapy and select a target that is um, um, accurate for that patient, maybe a stool test like fecal calprotectin, uh, CRP, um, or, you know, and then after a uh, short-term treatment target, we can reassess the disease and see if we have reached our target. Um, so the first short-term target should be, you know, my patient does feel better, but even more so, I want to see an improvement in the, those biomarkers, such as the fecal calprotectin and the uh, blood test. But if my target is not reached, then we need to reassess uh, the therapy, how can it be optimized and improved um, to try to reach the target. If we do reach the target, we continue this monitoring and to reach our longer term target, which should be perhaps normalization of the fecal calprotectin, absence of symptoms, um, and, and resolution of any inflammatory marker, uh, markers in blood tests, uh, even though that's not fully specific. And we, if we haven't reached that target, then again, we need to reassess why that is. Is it a problem with the um, amount of drug the patient is getting, or do we need to switch therapy? But if this is achieved, then we can continue with the long-term monitoring plan um, to uh, maintain this improvement and, and pick up uh, flares early on in the course of the disease. And this approach should reach to a, a long-term improvement and avoidance of bowel damage. So what do we have available right now to assess uh, this treatment target? So our gold standard should be the endoscopy and colonoscopy because uh, mucosal healing, as we uh, talked about, um, is, is, is really what gets us to a long-term clinical remission outcome. Um, so the histology perhaps is helpful, particularly in ulcerative colitis, but that's an evolving field. Uh, but uh, as you know, the problem with colonoscopies is that um, in North America, most people have this done in children under anesthesia and to represent time loss, really two days because of the clean out um, and, and, and then the procedure. So it's a two days of work loss, school loss. It's uh, uh, hard to repeat um, based on access to um, slots depending on uh, geographical region um, and also acceptability by a parent. As a parent, I wouldn't want my child to have 
you know, a colonoscopy every two weeks just to check, uh, uh, you know, if we're getting to our goals. So that's a little excessive. Um, so it does have its limitation, although it is uh, ultimately the um, goal that we have set for our therapeutic target. Um, biochemistry is helpful, so having blood work. Um, so we look at the C-reactive protein as an inflammation marker, the sedimentation rate, any signs of anemia or a low albumin can be a sign of small bowel disease or severe disease in UC. Um, so those biomarkers are uh, important, um, but they are not 100% specific, right? So any cold cough can raise um, inflammatory markers and maybe related to joint disease, which is um, often in association with IBD. So it's not a 100% great marker for intestinal activity. Fecal calprotectin is a better marker of inflammation, but it also has its limitation, uh, particularly in Crohn's disease. If it's an a patient with isolated small intestinal Crohn's disease, then some of the times of um, fecal calprotectin is not reflective of the inflammation uh, going on. Um, so it's really based on location that it can be helpful. And finally, we have CT enterography and MR enterography, uh, which are cross-sectional imaging that we can use to look at um, uh, intestinal inflammation. It's nice because it's non-invasive. It helps visualize directly inflammation. Um, and it helps us see the areas that we cannot reach with uh, just a colonoscopy. So all these areas of small bowel, which is really what it's the best for, um, can be assessed using these methods. Um, but I do hear from my patient, I have some patients who do not tolerate uh, drinking the contrast. So it's a lot of liquids. You drink like a liter of fluid for the older kids um, within the 30 minutes, you know, before the exam is done. It's a, it's a, it can be challenging. Uh, some of our patients don't have good IV access for when they need um, uh, to have IV contracts as well. Um, and there's starting to be some question about exposure to gadolinium and how that can perhaps accumulate in the brain. Um, so this is an evolving field. Not that we need to use gadolinium for every study, um, but you know, depending on the center, they may do that. Um, and in some areas, access to having slots in MRI can be difficult. Um, I know it's in Children's uh, Hospital Los Angeles, we have about a four month wait, which is quite long. Um, it can be shorter in depending on insurance and you know, uh, geographical region, but it's not a universal um, that uh, there is rapid access to imaging studies um, just everywhere um, in the world. Um, how about adherence to treatment? So this is a, a nice uh, study from Montreal that looked at real world data. So they looked at their database of patients and assessed uh, for patients on adalimumab, what was the adherence of treatment and how that affected treatment optimization over time. And they noticed that uh, there is a, a few tests that are not quite popular with their patient population. So we will come you know, pretty consistently to the clinical assessment, to their doctor's visit. Uh, blood work uh, starts to dropping off. And I think the nice thing is that this is with uh, adalimumab, which is a home treatment. So these patients are not tied to an infusion center where they're they at least take blood work more regularly. Uh, and bringing back stool sample is absolutely not popular. So only 25% in Crohn's patients, 33% in alpha cellulose patients would bring back a stool sample. In the pediatric population, there's a few studies looking at um, the, um, the adherence to bring in stool tests it's a little higher when you have a third party, uh, you know, collecting the stool and helping the doctor with these things. Um, but the, the highest I've seen is about 60 to 70 percent for real world data. So it's, we don't we wouldn't get all the information at each clinic visit, um, which is roughly every two to four months um, to make decisions on what would be the next step in management. So in summary, what are the issues in IBD management is that we have this growing population of patients coming to us uh, with a chronic illness. So they will stay with in, within our department for quite a long time. And uh, diagnosing this growing population uh, becomes tricky because we can't just, you know, uh, assume everybody and scope everybody uh, uh, who has symptoms that could be consistent with IBD. Um, but even beyond that, uh, this new um, 
paradigm for monitoring disease closely with objective markers can be difficult, both because of certain access to um, imaging studies and uh, procedures, but also for adherence of these, um, these markers uh, that we can use in the interim before we get to a repeat endoscopy. And uh, having this tight control approach can also have implication for medication prescription and optimization, can, which can inflate the cost of care um, over time. And we already know that there's quite a large um, burden in healthcare costs linked to the biologic use. So uh, in terms of monitoring, what if there's a way to identify disease activity or diagnose disease right in clinic at a point of care? So how that came from is, as Dr. Eichler said, I'm from Montreal, Canada, where I did uh, medical, where well, I'm born and did in medical school. And during my training, I've traveled quite a bit from um, Montreal to London, Ontario, back up to Montreal. We went to the West Coast in Vancouver for more training, and then uh, I landed in Alberta for a short time to learn uh, ultrasound. And the common theme between all these areas is that access to um, uh, imaging studies and to endoscopic uh, procedure slots can be quite tricky um, and have significant uh, wait times associated with that. So there was always a bit of a delay in being able to optimize treatment, diagnose disease, and get you know things going with our patients for the best outcome. So I finally landed in Los Angeles, which I, to my surprise, some of these issues are still happening. Um, and therefore it kind of motivated me to get uh, my research going. So, uh, so as I said, long wait time for MRIs are an issue, uh, wait list to have endoscopy under anesthesia is an issue, uh, and we want to avoid delay in treatment initiation and optimization. So intestinal ultrasound has a lot of benefits in uh, mitigating some of that. So it can be done right in clinic at the bedside. It's a short examination, takes about 10 to 15 minutes, maybe 20 for a new patient that you know, you, you, you're just fine kind of identifying the anatomy of uh, for a full scan. Uh, it's non-invasive, patients really love it. Um, and it, because stainless and it's, it's a low cost once you have uh, acquired the, the system and once you have it in clinic, it's really accessible. It's just a doorway. To, so if there's a question mark, you're not sure what the patient is feeling like, it really is just a, a matter of minutes before you can have a better idea of if you should be worried or not about what's going on. Um, so it's a very practical tool to have accessible in point of care. And the emergency department has known that for many years and have really developed uh, point of care um, algorithms to assess patients in the ED. So uh, the best part in GI is something that requires really no preparation is really the best. We're not wasting you know, hours or day fasting uh, to get ultrasound. So some uh, centers will um, request some drinking just non-carbonated fluid um, to help as a bit of a contrast to descend the bowel to see it better. Um, I find it's not very necessary to do that, uh, but it may improve some of the visualization and also identify uh, narrowing their strictures a little bit better. Fasting, even though radiologists do like fasting for bowel uh, exams, it's not necessary. Uh, none of my patients come fasting and we can still see quite well um, areas of inflammation if they are there. And the size of the patient though can be an issue because there are some limits into the penetration of the transducers in the abdomen. So a very large patient can be a little bit trickier to um, evaluate. Although in LA, we do have a population of larger uh, teenagers and obese children, and they're still getting their ultrasound and, um, and seldom missed an area of concern. So um, patient size may be a limitation, but with the right tools um, and the right pressure on the abdomen, uh, then it will still be able to visualize the, the areas of concern. So we take views in a longitudinal view. So as we look uh, like as a long view of the, of the tube of the intestine and in transverse view or axial view, uh, more like a donut to, to really get the best representation of the bowel um, and uh, the different position of the transducers can help with that. Um, and what we look at is the squiggly lines of dark and white uh, as the different layers of the bow wall. So um, we have a layer of darkness on the top, which is the muscularis propria, and the submucosa that is brighter and white, 
and then the mucosa that becomes a little bit darker. So this is the equivalent in one of the ultrasound pictures I've taken. Um, so you have here the muscularis propria, the submucosa, and then the mucosa underneath, and of course the lumen in between. Um, the similarly in axial view, you can see a nice donut shape um, descending colon here, uh, where you have the again the muscularis propria, the submucosa, and the mucosa. Um, representing the different bowel wall layers. And then what we look for uh, as a sign of inflammation is an expansion of these uh, bowel wall layers. Um, so bowel wall thickness has the most sensitive uh, sign of intestinal inflammation. So bowel wall thickness is considered to be abnormal when it's above three millimeters. This data is validated in adult studies. There's not tons of pediatric studies validating measurements for bowel wall thickness. So I think it's an area of opportunity um, that would need uh, a few centers gathering together to get this data, um, particularly for the colonic views. I think that uh, the colon um, in children probably needs smaller cutoff, um, but this needs to be investigated. Um, the other markers on ultrasound that are interest is bowel hyperemia. So we can use a uh, color Doppler to look for blood flow. So in a normal state, to, you know, non-inflamed bowel, there should not be a lot of hyperemia activity there. Um, but when there's more inflammation, um, there is increase in the hyperemia. And I'll show you pictures of that. The bowel loss tractification. So seeing these beautiful layers of dark, white, dark, on the ultrasound can become blurred with inflammation. So we start missing areas where the stratification is very clear. Um, so those are um, also signs of inflammation. And then we look outside the bowel for periintestinal fat or the creeping fat in Crohn's disease where uh, uh, fat around the bowel becomes brighter and more dense looking. Um, and finally, we can pick up complication of disease. And I think soon enough, we'll talk a little about uh, looking at the movement of the intestine or the peristalsis, which can be altered as well in areas that are inflamed. Um, you see that on MR interrography. So it's nice to see an um, ultrasound in real time uh, when the, the motility is affected. And there are even tools now coming out on the market that are specialized like add-on software to ultrasound that are specialized in looking at motility of the bowel. There are areas uh, that will be soon under investigation well, that are already under investigation, such as contrast enhanced ultrasound, which is using a bubble contrast IV to highlight areas um, of inflammation in the bowel, but mostly it's helpful in uh, assessing for complications such as abscess or inflammatory uh, masses, because um, it highlights them really well. The, the, the mass uh, or the abscess does not pick up contrast. Um, then we have elastography, which is looking at stiffness, perchance it's correlated with fibrosis. There's some current research on that using um, oral contrast, and small intestinal contrast, and hence ultrasound to highlight strictures. Um, transperineal ultrasound um, is also starting to be popular to really look at the perianal area and to detect uh, perianal fistulas, which are the most common fistulas in Crohn's disease, um, but also can help in looking for proctitis or even pouch disease uh, post-surgical for UC patients. And finally, using this to track uh, post-surgical recurrence of Crohn's disease um, is also under investigation. Um, so when we compare a normal looking colon, so this is the sigmoid, we have a thin bowel wall, it's very defined. Um, we can uh, help uh, looking at this by identifying the iliac muscle, the psoas, uh, the iliac vessel, sorry, the psoas muscle, and that helps identify where is my um, uh, loop of bowel, which looks normal here, uh, is very different than looking at an inflamed part. So we have here the skin, um, some intra-abdominal fat, and this area is uh, the bowel wall of the transverse colon, which is expanded. It looks inflamed. The lumen, which is not really narrowed, we look at uh, other dilation areas, but you know, it's a, a thinner looking lumen because it's so um, impressively thickened uh, on both sides of the bowel wall. Um, so those are things that we see. And hyperemia, as I talked about, is another marker for inflammation. So you have different uh, variation in the intensity. In a normal bowel, you shouldn't have much signals at all. But as we start having more inflammation, we have a short signaling, uh, a longer segment signal of inflammation. And then here we can even see uh, Doppler signaling inside the bowel wall and outside the bowel 
kind of highlighting those vessels feeding in to the to the bowel. Um, and finally, looking at complication of Crohn's disease, um, here we have a dilated loop of bowel. This area is a little bit more thickened. Um, if I pause here, so you have a thicker area. The lumen here, you see the fluid move um, into this more dilated loop of bowel. So this is indicative that we probably have a stricture. Um, so ultrasound on uh, systematic reviews uh, do correlate quite well with other cross-sectional imaging studies. This is done by radiology departments, however. Um, so where we see that the sensitivity and specificity of ultrasound but done by radiologists are uh, somewhat uh, correlating uh, with each other. So ultrasound could be a good uh, tool to use um, that would equate an MR interrogatory for children okay. um, and avoiding the radiation. So we did our study looking at the agreement between ultrasound and uh, MR interrography. Um, Obviously, there was a lot of variation based on the bowel wall segments as compared to the MRI. I think the other areas of, of discordance is the fact that MRI is much better to look at terminal ilium and at, at, at small bowel uh, sometimes than it is at colon, even though it can also detect inflammation there. Um, but uh, so there was various uh, correlation, but the highest was to look at the terminal ilium, um, which is quite uh, uh, nice to visualize on MRA and on terminal uh, and on the, the ultrasound as well. Um, I was surprised that the rectum had high <laughs> correlation as well, uh, because we um, uh, sometimes uh, it's really difficult to see the rectum. Uh, we have to use the a full bladder, and for some some kids, uh, to have that bladder window into the deep pelvis is, is not always present. Uh, so um, I was surprised that that was potential. It may be a sampling issue. And in terms of uh, the agreement, that's just looking at the percent of the inflame in both studies. Some uh, segments were missed, initially in the ultrasound uh, based on body habits and, uh, and the rectum being missed if the bladder was not filled. Um, so that's where the numbers are a little bit smaller here, but you know, pretty near uh, in, uh, in assessing for inflame segments. Other studies done in radiology department try to correlate bowel wall thickness with uh, the pediatric Crohn's disease activity index with, with symptoms um, and endoscopy using more like gestalt, uh, let's say, to say if it's, uh, inflammation was mild, moderate, or severe. And we found good correlation between the um, ultrasound and those, uh, and those studies. Um, so in our study, compared to colonoscopy, the ultrasound does miss sometimes. Again, the rectum is difficult to see. Sometimes with body habitus, there may be one segment that is hard to see. Um, when it's inflamed, though, I find that, and that's just personal opinion, I find that it's easier to, to find the bowel. Um, but uh, uh, so, so if I don't see anything at all, I tend to be a little bit reassured. But uh, overall, 12% of uh, the segments seen on colonoscopy were not, you know, were not visualized. And we were able to reach the terminal ilium via colonoscopy in all uh, colonoscopies. And that's not always the case uh, in some studies. So we looked at the correlation between bowel wall thickness and inflammation seen on uh, colonoscopy using endoscopic, or like official endoscopic scores, like the SCSCD for patients with Crohn's disease and the ulcerative colitis um, endoscopic index of severity, which is a, a score. We kind of modified those scores to really use uh, to assess for single segments instead of the entire colonoscopy. For example, the USCIS is supposed to be a score done on the worst segment of the colonoscopy. Um, but I did like segmental uh, UCIS uh, for each segment. And we found that there is a correlation where the most severe uh, or an association, I should say, using Paul Wallace uh, of the severity of uh, disease on the uh, colonoscopy as compared to the bowel thickness on ultrasound and similarly for patients with ulcerative colitis. Um, so it may be a good um, uh, tool to use um, uh, to, to, to screen for disease. And I forgot to mention, these are all patients that were newly diagnosed with uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease and the enrollment was uh, kind of screened to selected patients who had at least a calprotectin over 200. Um, so there is a wide um, 
discrepancy, let's say in this, in this, in this healthy bowel where we have a few outliers. But I think it's interesting to study these separately uh, because there may be a discordance between transmural inflammation and, and the scopic activity, uh, and that would be further um, work. So in this newly diagnosed uh, patient population, I uh, found a sensitivity and specificity of using ultrasounds of single bowel segments uh, to be 87% sensitivity, 60% specificity. What I thought was interesting is that the uh, negative predictive value was quite high. So using this as a screening tool uh, for a patient who has non-specific symptoms in, in the clinic can be helpful because if there really is nothing of concern on the ultrasound, the chance of finding um, uh, uh, inflammation on colonoscopy becomes quite low, but I think uh, um, uh, really uh, putting this together with an, another marker, particularly physical self-protection is, uh, is uh, if it's available, can help uh, change some of these uh, um, numbers as a compound uh, score. Um, and this was uh, looking at the uh, rock curve uh, of, of this study, uh, which gave us an area under the curve of 75% for discriminating um, uh, inflammation. And I, I define inflammation as a bowel wall thickness on an ultrasound, I mean, as a bowel wall thickness above three millimeters. Um, in terms of monitoring, so once our patient is diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease, do we see uh, uh, that the changes are responsive to treatment? Um, and we do see that. So in this uh, large study from Italy, uh, they looked at um, a patient on various different biologics, if they can monitor them over time. And those were all patients with Crohn's disease. And we do note that there's uh, a certain percent of these patients who reach transneural healing um, with uh, time, so three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months on treatment. And similarly, there's a certain percentage that reached um, transmural improvements or ultrasound markers improvement over time. So they show that at least uh, changes on the ultrasound are responsive to, to treatment for these patients. For a patient with ulcerative colitis, this is a large study from Germany called the Trust in UC study, where they looked at uh, patients starting new therapies with ulcerative colitis or who were already diagnosed but had inflammation at baseline. And uh, after optimization of treatment, as early as two weeks after starting uh, therapy, we actually see a drop um, in the uh, uh, inflammation. And this is kind of maintained after that in the subsequent visit. Um, so this can be an early marker of treatment response for a patient with ulcerative colitis. We saw that as well in uh, our patient at CHLA. So this is a young patient thought to have uh, ulcerative colitis. We thought mm, maybe it's more like Crohn's disease uh, based on this very impressive bowel wall thickness uh, of the transverse colon. At the time she was on adalimumab, we switched it to uh, uh, stakinumab. And this is after two and a half months on the new therapy. And we can see quite the improvement in the bowel wall thickness indicating that probably we're on the right track with our therapy. Um, this is another study patient who um, hesitated for a while to start uh, a biologic therapy. So at the first month where she was not yet treated after her diagnosis, we still see a lot of Doppler signaling. Um, but four months later on uh, a biologic treatment, we already saw improvement of this signaling. And now after seven months on the treatment, the signaling is much better. And when we actually measure the bowel thickness, this is a little bit small, but we see that we have now dropped under that three millimeter threshold. So uh, we are on the way to reaching um, transmural healing as well. And there still needs to be more data on the correlation with mucosal healing. Um, so overall in the cohort, and this is only representing 10 patients because this is ongoing research, uh, we look at, if we only look at the terminal ileum, which was quite uh, overrepresented in my patient population, um, initially eight patients had uh, inflamed terminal ileum and that dropped for the people with Crohn's disease and that dropped to two patients after uh, three months visits. Um, so the uh, raw number of change over time was uh, from uh, 4.2 uh, millimeters to 1.7 millimeters for the entire cohort, and that was uh, statistically significant. 
Um, what's nice as well is that we can catch worsening of disease. So this is also one of my study patients who um, also hesitated to start um, therapy initially. So the baseline uh, but was not very severe. Cause so it showed um, really subtle sign, I would say, of inflammation with a little bit more prominence in um, the muscular uh, propria on top. Um, so bile disease, he really didn't reach the numbers to say that this was inflamed, but the follow-up visit 10 weeks later um, showed a, quite an expansion of the uh, intestinal wall. So that gave more of an argument to start uh, a therapy. And what's really interesting is that this really informs the conversation, going back to this, you know, shared decision making, it really informs the uh, conversation with parents who actually seems to see this very well when we compare those images together. Um, so I do think that uh, having this imaging and having the patient participate in the conversation and in the ultrasound can lead to shared decision making. And there's starting to be studies looking at how uh, using ultrasound becomes a teaching tool and a, sh a shared decision-making tool in choosing the uh, next appropriate treatment in IBD. But um, what, is, what is going on in IBD is that now we have so many tools available uh, to monitor uh, treatment. So we can start with the simplest symptoms and PRO, as we already said, that they may not be the, the ultimate goal of treatment, but they're important goals because the patient wants to feel good and they want to be active and, and really uh, get back to living. Um, so having uh, the and symptoms improvement is in a way a monitoring tool and a short-term goal for therapy. Uh, then looking at our biomarkers, the therapy and fecal cal are really quite good and available to us commercially. Um, so uh, we can use that to monitor disease growth and just measuring our patient is important, making sure that they're reaching puberty, um, gaining weight and following their, their uh, curve um, is another sign of disease activity that we use commonly in clinic. And finally, we do have the ability of col colonoscopy and histology, um, even though that's more of a long-term goal, um, but it is available to us. Um, and finally, we have other markers such as the therapeutic drug monitoring and even, um, uh, sorry, uh, even uh, uh, genetic markers to predict immunogenicity in some of the therapies. Um, so where does that fit in the um, in the in, in the plethora of tools that we now have available? So the next step in research, I think, will be well, where do we place ultrasound in this treatment algorithm, and how does that affect healthcare delivery, and how does that affect cost of care? Because we do say a lot of assumption of the cost of this exam and what it would do, but it is performed by a physician in most areas. You know, it, it, it is a, a repeat exam. There may be a cost of, and claims that's soon to come of doing this exam. And it's repeatable many times in over the year versus an MRI that would be maybe once a year. So how does that actually affect cost is in interesting areas? And that would be my next step in research um, in the upcoming KDAM 24. So Overall, um, so the take-home message is that we have uh, this growing population of patients with pediatric IBD with an increasing complexity in the treatment options for them. Um, so uh, the uh, objective markers of uh, disease are important and available. So how do we modify this choice of management and algorithm and how do we inform patients about the disease status uh, is, is a very is a area of interest and seeing those non-invasive tools availability, how that affects clinical outcomes, in, you know, maybe earlier remission in those patients, um, but also investigating cost evaluation of care and those algorithm and treatment management um, will become important in the future. So with that, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Siobhan. That was an excellent uh, presentation. Fascinating research. We're always interested in improving outcomes and especially doing it non-invasively if, if possible. I know time is, is running short. And we understand if people have to leave, but I want to uh, see if anybody has any questions um, while you're here. Um, if not, I or while we're waiting, I had a couple of questions. Um, one was if you've looked yet at, um, and you talked about looking into some looking at shared decision making, which I think is is going to be really important. Um, I'm wondering if you've looked at outcomes related to this yet. You showed outcomes with 
um, endoscopic evaluation making a difference for the longer term outcomes and preventing disease and everything. Have, are, are you looking at or do you have any data on ultrasound yet to see if uh, doing uh, routine monitoring with bedside ultrasound actually leads to different outcomes? So that's uh, an area that is soon to come. This is kind of what I'm proposing in my K23, uh, because currently the studies of lo the longitudinal studies using ultrasound have not been as a decision making tool, but more as a monitoring to see if we even, you know, perhaps those changes don't really move on an ultrasound. So um, the closest like treatment to target uh, study out there is the Stardust, uh, that was a treatment to target um, with a, a, a sakinumab study that had an ultrasound follow-up arm, but the decision in escalating um, the uh, Stellara optimization was not based on the ultrasound, but rather based on endoscopy at 16 weeks and other markers. So we can't really say that this was a true treat to target ultrasound study. Um, and I, I, I really think there are some major players working on developing protocols for that at the moment. Um, so I'm hoping to do my own um, pilot RCC to at least see uh, in a pragmatic fashion, you know, uh, how, how likely are patients to come to visits, especially with the advent of telehealth. A lot of patients want to do our visit, their visit from home. Um, so that could mitigate some of the access to ultrasound based on patient preference. Um, but uh, I think what will be nice with ultrasound is to really do a pragmatic study so we can't really say, well, I'm not going to look at fecal caprotectin or anything that would be kind of you know, maybe not fully ethical when we have those available readily, but how would we integrate it into the care of patients who may not bring a caprotectin all the time? So having this pragmatic RCT as the next one, I think would be quite nice uh, um, to, to, to look at those outcome changes with ultrasound. Yeah, that'll be exciting to, to see. Um, do you, uh, while you're doing that, while you're planning that study, are you going to look at patient preferences or quality of life as well? Uh, yeah, so I'm doing a little bit of, of uh, uh, pre patient preferences. I don't think surveys are like the best way to really explore that in some some fashion. So uh, perhaps some qualitative uh, um, studies would help kind of at least understand preferences in terms of monitoring tools. Again, I feel like because I started everything in the midst of COVID-19, I think patient preferences have changed a little bit. Now they know that they could do a lot from comfort from home. Um, so that's something I'm also planning to explore in the future, but we're just uh, gathering that data at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's thrown. Uh... <laughs> It's changed a lot of things when it comes to care, <laughs> right. um, and also in-person care. Um, but ultrasound, obviously, you can only do in person. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, especially in the geographical location, Los Angeles, people don't want to drive more in the crowded highways. So um, it's definitely impacted uh, the ultrasound research quite a bit. But uh, um, we, we're keeping on, and and I think. Um, and now that we've been on Zoom for quite a while, some patients are starting to prefer coming back. So we'll see how that changes in the in the next year. Yeah, I, I, I we we've actually found that here in our GI group that uh, our, in pediatric GI the the in person visits have have gone up. You know, I'd say eighty percent of our visits are in person now. Where the adult GI group's exactly the opposite. Oh wow! Um, yeah, I, can't, I don't quite understand why. But um, I imagine in LA with uh, the sprawl and the traffic, people like being able to telecommute essentially. Yes, a Although lot. We have patients here who come from the Upper Peninsula, and it's a ten-hour drive for them, and and you know mm -hmm. that's it, it's a great benefit to be able to do things remotely, you know, for yeah. them, especially in the winter. Um, which you brings mean, to Jeremy, that it's rebounded to eighty percent compared to what it was before the pandemic? Okay. Yeah, so we're seeing mostly in-person visits, at least in our IBD group in PDF. Mm -hmm. But when I talk with the adult IBD uh, group, they're, they are just starting to push for more in-person visits. Mm -hmm. I think they said something like three quarters of their visits are still video vid mm -hmm. visits. Now. So there's definitely a difference, and I don't fully know why. Maybe parents want their kids to be seen in person. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. We have, pay, pay, we have families who just don't want to. Be, go anywhere near the medical center during COVID, but uh, it's interesting. See, Dr. Jo Dollinger has visited, joined us from New York as well, another big metropolitan center with uh, with terrible traffic. 
<laughs> I saw Mallory presenting and she she's a, a rock star. I've actually never, we never met in person. So I wanted to hear what she had to say. And that was an amazing presentation. So I just uh, wanted to say hi. And uh, this, I, I was so excited that the, you guys posted this on Twitter so I could learn. This is awesome. Uh, Mallory, I had a question. Um, so when it comes, okay. So I see what the effort is being done on the pediatric side. And I wanted to see what does this look like when they transition over to, to the adult side? Like if you're getting it under control with all these efforts, I think just in general, pediatrics seems like they're like blazing the trail or whatever when it comes to care and a lot of chronic illnesses, but then the transition, a lot of kids fall off or I should say young adults fall off. So what have you seen or do, can you speak to what that looks like when they transition over to the other side? Um, so I, I think transition of care to make it efficient and safe for a patient is, a, again, a growing area. And there's a, a lot of, of different models um, of combined clinic versus, you know, how do we remotely in a center who is an isolated, you know, pediatric center, how do we uh, transfer our patient over in a safe and concise manner? Um, uh, moving from one system to another, now I'm noticing that the insurance is like a big deal. It's the really hindering some of this uh, ability to transition in a smooth fashion. So something that would be would have to be independently looked at um, in the, the U.S. Like if there's ways to have um, insurance models that would do a smooth transition. My hospital treats 70% Medi-Cal patients um, and under a special program for chronic disease. So uh, that interest really does not cover any adult care until 21 and at 21, they just drop, you know, in the nothingness. Um, so it's, it's, it's really a, a hard thing to coordinate. Um, but uh, having seen kind of what is done in a the, in the one peer system, like when, when that, that is not a hindrance, I'm not saying that it's, it's better, but you know, at, at least there can be a conversation in a way um, that is a, a little bit more productive. But um, so, so I think if we in pediatric can optimize care in a way that the patient is stable at the time of transfer, then uh, there is better success in the adult world uh, to, um, to maintain that success that we reach in pediatric. Um, so that would be the first is to get a clinical, you know, clinical remission um, in the pediatric time. And then we can spend more time working on, uh, you know, self-efficacy and the, 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 the ability to empower our patients to take care of their own health um, and with mitigating those helicopter parenting that we sometimes uh, uh, come uh, to, to meet uh, in our practice. Um, but yeah, so so the, the other area that's hard for me to address is when I trained, because I did a combined adult pediatric IVB training. Um, so when I would see those patients transition, um, you know, depending on the therapy they were on, some of them would transition uh, on, let's say, a immunomodulator and come with their stricture in adult world at 21. And that you, so really, I think what's nice with having um, objective markers now is that we can really see uh, how our treatments are working and preventing those complications so that they don't show up at 21 or 25 with already their complication of disease and that becomes a complicated course. Um, so a lot of work in pediatric is based on uh, ensuring success in the adult world. But that transition, I think, is still a work in progress. Well, if there aren't any more questions, thanks so much, Mallory, for joining us and sharing about your work and your future plans. Um, and I hope that um, if there's anyone in the center that can be of help for your work, that you'll reach out and, and vice versa. Um, these are always good opportunities to connect and, and start to define collaborations. So, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Presentation. Bye. Bye. Take care, everyone. We'll see you in two weeks if you're still on. <laughs>